Hi, my name is John Messina, host of our TV show, Hey Coach. And today we have two esteemed, and I use that word very lightly, <laughs> two esteemed former athletic directors, great friends of mine, R.J. Costello, who was the athletic director at Jensen Beach and at South, uh, South, South, Fork. South Fork for many years. Michael Ingram, who was the athletic director at Martin County and also an administrator in the school system. You know, I thank you guys from your busy schedules. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Well, thanks for inviting us, John. Okay. And thank you, John. And I think we had, we edited it up, we had 111 years of athletic experience between the three of us on the show you today. You the most. <laughs> yeah, I got the most. I'm 44. But anyhow, RJ, let me talk about you first. Uh, give me a little bit of your background <clears throat> and how you got involved in education. Okay. Um, well, it all started back in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, my whole family was involved in education. My dad was a football coach um, for 30 years and guidance counselor, history teacher. My mother was a principal secretary at a Catholic high school. Uh, my little sister is a kindergarten teacher. My other older sister works at John Carroll University. So I, I, I had education in my, in my bloodstream. Um, I, um, after, after high school, um, went to Clemson University in 1981. Go Tigers. Um, so you were national champs. I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. I had a, a scholarship to wrestle, so I wrestled there for a year and transferred up to West Virginia and finished my career at West Virginia. Um, had a job opportunity in Stewart and um, drove down. Actually, I was on spring break, interviewed for a job um, with an elementary um, principal. His name was Roger Chancy, And um, the interview lasted about two minutes. He asked me where I was from. And when I told him I graduated from West Virginia University, he said, I'd go home, pack your stuff. I got a fourth grade job for you. Why don't you come on down? So That's 32 great. years ago, I packed my stuff and came down. And I taught fourth grade for 12 years and coached wow. um, wrestling and football and track at Martin County High School. And, and then you got the job at South Fork. Right? Before I went the administration route and um, was the AD at South Fork for seven years, and then I uh, was 15 years at Jensen Beach. Now, Erie, Pennsylvania, that's Erie, a Pennsylvania. Big, big football area, right? Yeah, real big football big area. Big time yeah. area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. yeah. cold too. Oh, <laughs> it was cold as you, though, Mike. Uh, Michael's a little bit cold. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I grew up in the great oh. state of Minnesota. Okay. And uh, you, could, you, could, you could be guaranteed that it was going to be cold from first part of October till the end of May. So that's the way it was. But I started my educational career, I started down here. I played football in college and baseball in college at a small division three school, University of Wisconsin La Crosse. At that time they were called the Indians, now they're called the Eagles. Um, so that's a whole they, other aren't story. They, they're very, very good in, in football now, right? Or they, they've been years? on, yeah, on yeah. and off. They've been yeah. very good at division three. Right football. But anyways, um, I got hired kind of like RJ's talking about. The the guy that got a head football coaching job at Martin County High School and, and he happened to his wife's parents were friends of my parents and uh, they happened to find out that I was graduating from college and he asked me if I was going to coach and I said, yeah, I'd love to coach. I want to teach. So I started teaching physical education and coaching football. And then after a couple of years of baseball coach, because I love baseball, I'd coach Legion Ball back in Minnesota. He asked me if I'd come out and be an assistant coach. So I was an assistant coach in baseball. And then a couple of years after that, he, he decided to, to move on. And, and I got lucky enough to get the head, head baseball coaching job at Martin County High School. So I was there nine years as head coach. John, you know, because we played. Um, my idea was always to play the best, and John Messina's teams were always right up there as the best. So, and that's where, you know, John and I first met. Then after that, um, I got into school administration, was a middle school assistant principal, then became the athletic director at Martin County High School, was nine years there. Um, then I detoured off of the athletic path and went back into um, being a, an administrator as an assistant principal, ultimately being a principal at, at um, a very unique school called Challenger School, right. which is a K through 12 situation right. that had um, emotional behavior disordered kids and, and uh, kids that were physically and mentally handicapped and was the principal there. Greatest experience of my educational career. That's terrific. 
And then after that, I went downtown and, and did my little tour of duty downtown as a coordinator of student services. So I, I've been through the Wide gamut range, of, yeah. of jobs yeah. within the school district and enjoyed every minute of it. That was 35 years worth of fun and excitement. You got a lot in it those 35 <laughs> years. Right. You, you sure really did. did. RJ, if you had to say one person that influenced you in coaching as you were starting up, who would that be? <clears throat> Probably, um, I'd have to say my father. Okay. Um, I, I finally realized um, how my, my gray hair started at an early age because he used to drag me to football practice back in the day. and. Back in the day when he was coaching, they didn't want any athletes to get athletes' foot, so they'd have a big foot box with all kinds of powder in it. Really? So I was so tiny, they used to pick me up by my ankles and dunk me in that thing, and I'd come running over to my dad yelling, and I think that's what changed my hair color um, so quick. But, um, you know, also, um, you know, the coaches that I had, my football coaches and wrestling coaches that I had in grade school and in high school were very influential and kind of steered me toward education. Michael, how about you? Well, I think, you know, a lot like RJ, my dad was very instrumental in, in coaching me in the Little League levels, and then I had a great high school football coach, and then was lucky enough to be real close friends with the son of the um, football coach that I had in college, and he was a great guy. Roger Herring, God rest his soul, was a, just a fantastic motivator. So I learned a lot from those guys, but the thing that really, I think, sticks out for me as far as mentorship is when I got to Florida, being a boy from the north, there's different ways of doing things in Florida because of the weather. You can do things year round. And getting into baseball, there were three guys that were very influential for me. One was Rick Dixon, who was the baseball coach at John Carroll High School. And, and then Tim Gillis, who was the head baseball coach at Okeechobee. And then after getting to meet you, John, and learning from you and how the good teams were doing it, um, those are really the three people that I consider in my professional side of my career as being the most influential for me. Do you miss it? Yes. I know it's a yes for you I, too. I, I miss I think, the daily interaction with sure. the kids too sure. and, and my coaches um, every day and what happened, what didn't happen, what you got to pre get prepared for. And um, But it, it Makes the day go by quick, so it did. What do you miss? For me, for me, a hundred percent, it's the kids. It's I mean, when I walk into the grocery store or somewhere and I hear, "Hey, coach, how's it yeah. going?" Um, mm -hmm. One of the nicest things, John, you know, because we're doing a little volunteer baseball coaching. Um, three of the kids that are that are coaching that team are kids that either played for me or yeah. or I or I knew yeah. very well. So I coached with you guys, yeah. 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 So I mean, yeah. that's those kinds of things I miss being around kids. Now, now, since we have so much experience and so many years in high school athletics, <laughs> what do you think the biggest change, RJ, is from when you started to where high school <clears throat> athletics is now? Wow. <laughs> That's a tough one. Huh? It is. Let's start with the students. You know, How the, 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 students the, the students are a little different than what they are up north because we're landlocked in the, the winter time. You know, they're in the gym and they have yeah. to. Out here, there's so many distractions for these kids with the weather and the nice beach and the boats and the swimming and stuff. Um, you know, the dedication has changed. I think over the years, um, um, we used to. I know when when all of us first started, um, we'd have um, we'd have that athlete that we you know kept on hearing about in middle school. He's in seventh and eighth grade. Oh, he's a great basketball player. Oh, the kid can also play football and he can run track or or do something in the spring. And um, you know, my last ten years, I think we've had one or two multi-sport athletes. That's it. And, See, you I know, and the, the, the kids yeah, are yeah, you know too. taking care of the grades, which right. is number one, right. you know, right. top priority and they're making sure their academics are where they're, they're at. But, you know, those kids also could be leaders on other athletic teams where they're just singling out, just concentrating on one sport right. or so. Um, now, where do you think that's coming from? Well, you know, money's involved. Um, you know, I mean, if a kid gets a scholarship nowadays, you could be talking over $100,000 uh, at, at one of these out-of-state schools. So, um, you know, once I think maybe the parents see that, you know, you know Johnny or their daughter Sally or, or good volleyball players or good football players right. or so, maybe they just kind of veer and just, um, you know, concentrate on that one sport. But I, I remember I, I was on the FHSAA Student Athlete Committee, mm -hmm. 
And the first year, Dave Currier, who was the AD at West Boca, and myself were one of the original people on the committee. And when we first started, we probably had four or 500 applications. And one of the applications, you had to play two or more sports for four years. Mm -hmm. When we got near the end, we barely got to 100. Yeah. Because kids were, were just concentrating on that one sport, you know? What do you think, Michael, was the biggest change in, in student athletes over the years? Well, I think, I think really it has to do with, with the um, access to um, those outside programs. Um, you know, if, if I'm a volleyball player, I can play on a travel volleyball team, um, you know, for months leading into the high school season and one of the things that I, that I think changed maybe not so much about kids yeah. but about the way everybody approaches sports is they're playing so much year round and so focused that when they actually get to the high school season sometimes those travel teams have traveled the nation it's a downer instead of just, it's a downer right yeah florida yeah. so sometimes yeah. where it used to be um, and and part of that is the whole idea that now high school athletes can basically choose the school they want to go to. Correct. You know, there's all the legislature and all the right. rules that have come there. And I think that's changed it. But I think that's changed the game for high schools, that there's so much more out there that is very specialized and meant to get those guys the scholarships yeah, and things and like you, that. If you can't get involved at, at the high school level, something's wrong with all the clubs and activities and, yeah. and different athletic teams that we have. I mean, it's um, it's really hard not to be involved. And we, we you know try to push that toward the kids that try to be as well-rounded as possible. I, I always thought that one of the biggest changes nowadays is that, you know, years ago, you could explain situations to the student athlete and it was going to be done. Now, and, and this is just the way life is right now, a lot of times the student athletes want to know why. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Why am I doing that years ago? And sometimes, you know, part of our job as, as teachers and as coaches, and I always felt that a uh, coach is a teacher, you got to adapt. Yeah. You know, which kind of leads me into my next question. Is, well, let me, let me yeah. ask you a question, though, yeah. too. I mean, one of the probably hardest decisions that a 17 or 18 year old kid's going to make is what college to go to. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, you're 17, you're 18, you know, what do you want to do? I want to be a football player. I want to be a baseball player. I mean, that's what these kids want to do. They don't, they're, they're not thinking 30 years down the road that, hey, I might be an educator or a doctor or an attorney or something oh. like that. And yeah. so that's, that's, the, that's probably one of the, right. the hardest choices that, and I think the kids are stressed out so much that yeah. sometimes the kids that um, actually sign early, their, their junior year yeah. or in the fall of their senior year, it's just a, such a big relief off their shoulders. And you can see that it's affecting you know, them playing and stuff. I don't know where I'm gonna go. Everybody's asking them, what school are you gonna go to? You know, you're a superstar and, right. and they don't know that. And, um, and that's, that's, that's a real hard decision that you know, the parents and the coaches sit down with the, you know, the kids and try to decide what fits best because there, you know, there is a school for everybody, but they just have to find it. So. Right, and, and one of our biggest challenges is, is to try to guide them in the right way. Yeah. You know, Coaches and athletic directors would to guide you, all right? Students got to find, that's their job to pick out the school, and you're there to help them and guide them in every way. And a lot of times, people got to be realistic, okay? Everybody's not going to be a Division One player. Mm -hmm. Everybody's not going to be a Division Two player. I mean, they have that chart of how many people make it from high school to, to junior college, to college, then to the pros, and it really, really dis, uh, diminishes over the years and everything. But um, as an athletic director, Mike, what do you think your biggest challenge was? I mean, you know, the, the years of experience we have all as athletic directors, what do you think your biggest challenge was? I think, I think our biggest challenge was making sure that we had a way to properly fund all the sports so that they could, they could put the best team on the field with the best uniforms, okay. the best equipment, and, and how to make all those things um, fit together and do the fundraising. For me, that was, that was your challenge. we spent a lot of time okay. doing that because our school district, for whatever reason, they funded certain things, and then the rest, it was up to the right. programs. And, and like most high school programs, it, it related around how many people you could get in the stands for a football game, a basketball right. game. And, and so you had to do some 
PR work, and if you had down years and people didn't show up to the games, and you, make you, be money. you better you better get creative right. and find in other ways. So that was the biggest challenge, I think, or one of the bigger right. challenges yeah. for us. The other one is making sure that the kids, um, really making sure the kids knew that that athletics was an extracurricular program, and it was a it was a privilege to play. It wasn't something that was owed to them because right. not all kids understand that. They, right. They're they used to playing in the Little Leagues and everybody gets a chance to play. And so we would do a lot of, of teaching right. about what the expectation is for programs and how they're selected and making sure that we're doing the best we can do with being fair in that selection process <clears throat> because that's one of the hardest things that that as an athletic director, we had to sit on the backside and listen to the mommies and daddies right. whose kids didn't right. get picked for the team. So educating them up front about what it meant and how it was done, um, to me, was a challenge, too. What did you think, RJ? <laughs> Toughest challenge <clears throat> as an athletic well, director? Well, uh, you know, the fundraising and, you know, the financial aspect of it, like Mike said, was always challenging every year. You're, you're you know, creative, you're this way or that way. But, um, you know, we, we tried to tried to stress on the academics at, at Jensen Beach. I'd like to shout out to the Falcons. They actually, every athletic team in the fall and in the winter and in the spring at Jensen Beach last year had a cumulative 3.0 and above GPA, which That's is terrific. amazing because you know how we're yeah. all of a sudden looking yeah. at this team and that team to make sure everybody's... Um, so, so I think the kids understand it because they hear it from their guidance counselors, they hear it from their coaches, they hear it from their parents when they get home that, you know, academics, academics, and if you don't have any academics, there won't be any colleges. Right. So, um, you know, a, a, a challenging part, you know, the last 10 years or so, um, I would probably have to say is the, uh, the amount of coaches, you know, the turnover and, you know, just trying to, trying to get some quality people, like Mike said. You know, we want to, you know, go out there. We got some great athletes. We want to hire the best coach possible mm -hmm. that can, you know, prepare these kids, um, you know, both, you know, to get them ready for their life and to get them ready for that next step if they're that good to play in college. But, um, you know, it's just in these, these coaches get a bad taste and then the time is involved and then this and that. And, and just uh, I just want to throw it out there, maybe a winter sport. Um, you know, the winter sport, you know, start right around Thanksgiving. So you have the Thanksgiving break. Then you have your Christmas vacation. Then you have, you know, and here coaches are preparing their team to try to wrestle or play basketball or something in the best tournaments over the break. But, you know, the family has a vacation in Colorado. Or And and what can you do, John? Yeah, you, know, you know how, how important family is. And, yeah. and for some parents, and unfortunately, we have some, some fortunate ones down in this area, but... For some families, that might be the only break that dad and mom have right. for the week, and, and they've been planning this vacation for 20 years. But here, you know, you're a coach, and here you need, you know, you want your starting team at this big tournament because you're playing the returning state champs and this and that. And so it's a, we're always struggling to find coaches that, you know, are into it for the right reason and stuff for the kids and um, trying to just get them ready for the next level. See, I think that kind of leads me into my biggest challenge. I thought my last few years was how do I get – my coaches to improve. How do we educate our coaches? You know, every year teachers are going to workshops to get better. Different methods are coming out to them. Coaching has changed. Mm -hmm. Coaching has changed over the years. I mean, you know, you, you could take the, the best college coaches or even some of the pro coaches. Everything has changed now. But how do we convince, especially our younger coaches, you don't know everything, mm -hmm. okay? You really don't know everything, okay? And if you think you know everything, then the guy next to you is going to beat you because he's going to he's going to work harder. You know, I, I I always felt that in the summer I would always sit down with my players and say, you know, what are you going to do to get better? And I wanted them to ask me too. I said, Coach, what are you going to do to get better? What are you going to be different? That's why you know nowadays with all the emphasis, they always should have had this, but nowadays more emphasis on safety issues and. And, and other issues, academic issues, you know, there should be mandatory workshops that these coaches have to go to. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw this out, and I know it's a very touchy subject, is, is safety issues, you know. Mm -hmm. you got to have your coaches aware of safety issues. You know, some counties have trainers, some counties do not have trainers. Um, are your coaches, you know, the FHSA mandatories, mandates that you have to watch a video for 30 minutes and on this and that, you know, it's more, it's more, 
educational, you bring in somebody that actually demonstrates, you know, what you got to do. But again, how are coaches able to deal with parents? Parents have changed over mm -hmm. the years mm -hmm. because years ago the parents now were our players, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and it, it, things have changed over the well, years. Well, and you guys are both probably the same way. I mean, when we're interviewing for not head coaches but assistant yeah. coaches too you know you t try to tell your head coach that you know you want your assistants that want to be head coaches right. you don't want an assistant coach that just wants to come in here and just be a freshman coach all his life yeah. or be an assistant coach because then they're they're never going to go up the ladder and you know right. learn learn more about that particular sport but um yeah it's um you know finding quality coaches johnny it's been it's, it's been hard. rough the last it, couple of years hard. it really and, has and I, I always felt that like when you have a staff like a big football staff sometimes a basketball staff i didn't want all my coaches on the same page i want to of course you're going to have the same goal you're going to work you have your disciplinary and you have your academic right. person you have your little fundraiser coach right and, and I, I want a difference of opinions to work together for one goal at the end you know but a lot of times we were stuck hey i need somebody to be a JV soccer coach or something like that. Well, who knows soccer? Okay, and and you know a lot of times we're stuck. But I I think that's the biggest thing. And, and I was kind of hoping um, when Doc before Doctor Deering left up at the FHSA that he would put something in mandatory. For the coaches. The coaches had to take classes every year. They can get in service points. They can work for the recertification or maybe each school district. But I think we're letting that lapse. And yeah. and you know. Um, there was a day when the coach, at least in Martin County, they had to have a, a yeah. all coaches, assistant mm -hmm. coaches, head coaches, had to have prevention of care of athletic injuries. Yeah. They had to have first aid right. CPR training, and they had to have some basis or background in coaching that sport, whether it was by experience of coaching it before or, or something in, in school. Yeah. That, where they took coaching related classes right. um and that would give you your and, coaching endorsement right you right. had to have a coaching yeah. endorsement now um that's kind of went by the wayside a little bit too or or they do it online you know you can take this online coaching well, class there's and there's not that interaction well, there's, yeah. you know you guys know as well as i do in a perfect world yeah. you know your best coaches are your teachers right in the classroom absolutely but you know, Absolutely. once they start having families and, sure. you know, their own kids are participating in sports, it's hard to have them after their school day go pick up their kids, come over and watch kids right. for a couple hours. So so it's it, we're, we're getting more and more non-educator coaches. So like Mike said, that, you know, you have to start from basics and teach them how to do first aid, CPR, and everything. Um, but yeah. where have you learned? A lot of times coaches are afraid to learn from other coaches. Well, I felt that's I was, where we get all our ideas. You I know, know, it's just like I, teachers. I felt teachers that, yeah. take different ideas from yeah. other teachers sure. and implement them in their classroom. But, and yeah, but it's like a lot of times I'm not going to tell anybody what I'm doing. You know, when I was down <laughs> in Miami, I wanted to be the best Steve. I'm going to. What did you do in practice? Because I'm going to take that routine. Right. You know? yeah. But a lot of times, RJ, one of the things I want to talk about. We have a sport that that kind of goes unnoticed, but it's getting bigger and bigger in Florida. Is wrestling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there has been some changes in, in high school wrestling. Can you go over that? Yes, um, the, um, the FHSA, the Florida High School Athletic Association, last year started a state dual tournament. Now, what do you mean by a dual? Well, the, the state tournament is, is a team tournament as well as it's an individual tournament. Okay. You advance, you know, the top four in districts go to regions, right. top four in regions go to the state tournament. And, um, That's on the individual level, On an right? individual level, but okay. you still have a team champion. This is just a dual match, so it would be Martin County against Jensen Beach would just wrestle off head to head, okay. and whoever wins would advance. So now the whole team would advance. The whole team the advances. Whole team. The whole team advances. Okay. Yes, and you can actually weigh a couple kids in per weight class, and you know move your lineman yeah. around a little bit depending upon who you're wrestling. So um, they just started it last year. It's it's a great addition to wrestling. I think it'll definitely help the sport. It'll create some more rivalries, which we've get, right. gotten away from since everybody goes to tournaments now every week. Um, but um, actually, Mark, uh, Jensen Beach hosts um, today the regional right. tournament. It's today at Jensen Beach, and they wrestle they wrestle Merritt Island right. and Palm Bay wrestles Okeechobee, and then the two winners wrestle each other after the first match. So now they still have the finals up in Lakeland. And no, it's in Orlando. Orlando now. It's Orlando. It, now. it actually was. Um, it was at Silver. Sp or no, it was at um, um, Osceola High School last okay. year. So they take the top um, 
for 1A, 2A, 3A, because we get to have three classifications in wrestling, right. and then the top four teams, and then they'll, they'll compete up in, uh, if it's Kissimmee this this year, I don't know if it's Kissimmee or, or Silver Spur, but yeah. The know. top four teams from each class? Classification, yeah. So actually there's 12 teams. 12 teams, yeah, and, and they'll have three mats, and they'll have you know them against them and then the winners all and wrestle yeah so it'll be like the semifinals actually. and if i understand it right what's really changed is you know before you'd have your some wrestlers that would qualify for state and they'd go on but then you'd have some other guys that that were good wrestlers but they they, weren't they were in the top, the top four of regions yeah, yeah they, they weren't some, in the yeah. top four so they'd be going home now you have a chance for those kids they didn't get a That's chance the, on the to end advance, of it, yeah. to because because they're with a team that right. they can go. But now the so team, that's now that, more kids but the an team tournament is, I want to say maybe two weeks before the district tournament Good. would start. So okay. so they would have the team out of the way, and then right. all of a sudden the district tournament regionals and then. Yeah, have so they so ended the stuff. season now? Or? I think it's I think it actually um, just a week or so. Just a week or so. Yeah. Now let me ask you because there's no. If I'm not mistaken, there's not any colleges in Florida that have wrestling. Is, does that hurt? Well, with, with like Southeastern has wrestling. Okay. UCF has a has a team, but but not 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 in a, yeah not like Division One. Yeah, like um, yeah. well, back John and I want to say it was eighty three, yeah. eighty four. The um, all the like the ACC schools dropped their program. Kentucky. What is that money? Wise? Clemson. Well, it was caused by Title IX, and um, had a you yeah. know, Syracuse. Syracuse and Syracuse. Tennessee were in the top ten every year, yeah. and they both dropped their programs on um, because of Title IX. So, um, at the college level, um, uh, you know, I wish wrestling would you know add a few more schools. I, yeah. I don't even think there's over 100 schools Division One or yeah. so that are, that are in wrestling right now, but. Um, at the national level, it's doing great. Um, we have a great freestyle team, a great Greco-Roman team. Actually, there's right. they've just started a few years ago and having women's freestyle right. and Greco in the Olympics. So, um, and the United States has done very well. Very good, years, very good, know. yeah. But uh, well, listen, as our time is flying by here, <laughs> you know, I really want to thank you guys, and and you know, I know as good friends, you guys have been a big credit to high school athletics. I know we well, still want you. to be involved. You know, mm -hmm. Mike and I are trying to get involved over in Martin County and then you're involved at Jensen Beach and, and and you know hopefully you know maybe one day they'll put in an in-service that we all can get involved in because all we want to do is make the younger coaches better better mm -hmm. okay and I, I think a lot of times you know you're content and you can't be content okay you always want to be better if you want your student athletes to be better he won't be better as a coach. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Nick Saban studying what he did wrong in the Clemson <laughs> game right now, you know, because he's going to improve every year and he wants his coaches to improve. But again, I want to thank you guys for coming. Thank okay. you. Thanks for having us, John. Okay. And thanks to another edition of Hey Coach. <laughs>